Well, good morning, church. You want to go ahead, grab your Bibles, uh, open up to Galatians chapter 6. We'll be in verses 7 to 10 this morning as we continue in our series on what it looks like to be a Christian in a time of plague, in a time of pandemic. Now, uh, we are not the first group of Christians to have to live through a pandemic. In fact, this was a fairly regular occurrence early on in the life of the church and really for centuries to come. Rodney Stark in his important book, The Rise of Christianity, actually shows how the response of Christians to people during times of plague is what led to the rise of Christianity, what led to Christianity becoming the dominant religious force in the world uh, during the time of the Roman Empire. He uh, quotes Dionysius, Bishop of Alexandria, who uh, wrote during the plague of Cyprian, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely happy, for they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many, in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead. And he goes on to contrast that response, the response of many of the unbelievers at the time, he writes, but with the heathen, everything was quite otherwise. They deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends. They shunned any participation or fellowship with death. And that contrast couldn't be sharper. Embracing death sacrifice for the sake of others on the one hand, and on the other hand, rejecting others for the sake of self. In a time of plague, our default human response is one of self-preservation. We want to preserve our lives, our property, our comfort. But of course, Christ calls us to self-denial because Christ calls us to love. And love always involves sacrifice. Love always costs. And we just have to count it more in a time of plague. A pandemic forces us to reckon with true Christian love, what it means to love as Christ loved us. So it tests our love in much the same way that this trial will test and refine our faith. Now, C.S. Lewis reminds us that love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved one's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. I think that's an important distinction here. It has been easy for us to love, to feel affection for people in a time of prosperity. But now it's going to cost more, as I said uh, our love will have to be others-centered, and it's going to conflict with our self-centered desires. It is we're not only going to have to wish for, but work for the other's ultimate good. Um, just a quick note, too. You may be tuning into this uh, sermon this week, and you're not a regular attendee of our church, and maybe even just checking out Christianity. And this, I think, is the challenge for us right here, uh, to understand what will motivate us to keep counting the cost of loving others well? And I think the answer may surprise you. To persist in love, we're going to need to dig deep. We're going to need to look at the roots in our hearts if we want to produce the fruit of love in our behavior. And Paul's going to help us here. He gives us the principle, the precept, and the practice of how we're going to love well in a time of plague. So let's start with the principle from verse 7. Here's Galatians 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So Paul opens by saying, do not be deceived. The word there means to be misled. I find it interesting that this is a passive command you're getting bullied at school or something, and as you leave in the morning, your mom says, hey, don't be punched today. That would feel like a weird command. Why not call the school and have them tell the bullies, don't punch me anymore? Uh, but here we have Paul saying, don't be deceived. Don't be punched. 
And I think he's saying that because he knows that we're already in the ring. <laughs> People are going to be throwing punches regardless. We have an enemy who seeks to deceive us, and there are many who are happy to participate in his deception. And so it's up to us to resist deception. And we do that by knowing the truth as well as we possibly can, similar to bank tellers who are able to identify counterfeit money by handling real money as often as possible. We need to handle the truth as often as possible so that we can recognize error when it comes our way. Now, what is the lie that we're uh, being asked to believe, being misled into? The lie is that your words and your deeds don't have to line up. Your walk and your talk don't have to be the same. But this is why Paul says in the next line, God cannot be mocked. That suggests the seriousness of what's going on here. False professions of faith, people who claim Christ as Lord but do not live as if he is Lord, aren't fooling God, and he will not condone it. Uh, hypocrisy in the church is one of the primary ways that the name of Christ is dishonored today. You talk to people who don't believe or who have walked away from the faith, and they will often point to hypocrites in the church as the reason why. It leads the world to mock God. His name should be held in honor. It will be held in honor among all people, as Paul reminds us in Philippians 2. So what will happen to those who brought dishonor on it? It's a serious question. It's what leads Paul into the principle that he shares with us here. A man reaps what he sows. This is blindingly obvious, of course. Uh, if a farmer plants wheat, he's going to be awfully surprised if corn comes up in the fall. But there's a reason why Paul tells us this. Because we want to choose the seed before harvest time comes. Farmers don't often go out and simply scatter seed and then in a few months go, oh, hey, I guess corn is coming this time. Uh, that's not how this works. The same with us. We want to be very careful. What exactly are we sowing? And are we sure we know what the seed is? I was talking to a lawn care guy because my lawn uh, is not up to suburban standards, and so the neighbors have complained, I think. Uh, so I was talking to one, and he, he suggested I scatter some seed to help with some of the bare patches. And he recommended I not use one particularly well-known brand because he said it, the grass seed is often filled with uh, weeds as well. <laughs> Same, uh, the seeds are in there. And that's because this particular company sells a lot of the weed control products, and so they're happy to have you plant weeds. That's a separate issue, of course, but uh, it, it suggests a good illustration for us. We may think we're scattering good seed, only to discover that weeds are coming up over time. And so we have to ask the question again, not what do I want to sow, although that's an important question, but what am I already sowing? There's an old adage, you probably heard it, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Uh, I think that's very true. And there's an undeniable uh, fact contained in that, which is that we have thought and acted many times over. Now, however many years you've been alive, that many years you have been sowing thoughts and acts already, which means you are already reaping the habit and the character at this point. If you spent the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years ogling attractive women, you are an ogler at this point. If you spent the last couple of decades being careless with your words and with the confidences of your friends, you are a gossip at this point. That's challenging for us. We always want to think, well, that's, that's what I did. That's not who I am. But I don't think that's true. Over time, this becomes precisely who we are, and God will not be mocked. So we need to take this seriously. Now, James K.A. Smith helps us understand some of the implications of this truth. He writes this, To recognize this is to appreciate something about the mechanism of temptation. Not all sins are decisions. We think temptation is an intellectual reality, where some idea is presented to us that we then think about and make a conscious choice to pursue or not. But once you realize we're not just thinking things, but creatures of habit, 
you'll then realize that temptation isn't just about bad ideas or wrong decisions. It's often a factor of deformation. What he means there is our choices form us, except they actually deform us. So it's a matter of deformation and wrongly ordered habits. In other words, our sins aren't just discrete wrong actions and bad decisions. They reflect vices. And overcoming them requires more than just knowledge. It requires rehabituation and reformation of our loves. And those two words are key. Rehabituation. We need to form new habits. And how do we do that? Well, we need to reform our loves. That's an interesting point he makes. How do we pull up the weeds by the roots and sow a new character? Well, there's a question we have to ask first. And Smith gives us the answer to that question in the title to the book I just quoted, You Are What You Love. Every act that is sown springs from a desire within us. We do what we want to do. So we want to focus immediately on behavior. What should I be doing during a time of plague to take care of my neighbors? But before doing is being, who should I be in a time of plague? And before being is actually loving. What do I love? What should I love? So while we focus on behavior, God would have us examine our hearts. Augustine puts it well. He says, my weight is my love. Wherever I am carried, my love is carrying me. That's the whole idea. Whatever action that we perform, it's springing from a love within us. So in what direction are we being pulled? What choices do we tend to make? That's what you love. So how do we transform our behavior? We have to change what we love. Now, you may be skeptical at this point. Again, why can't we just get to the behavior piece? But we can't skip this. It won't work, at least not in the long haul. We need something powerful enough to transform us from the inside out, to reorient our loves. And I know of almost nothing in this life that can do it. Marriage certainly doesn't, for example. And we may think so because we get engaged and we think, well, I'm completely centered on the other person. It doesn't last very long before you start to insist on your own way in marriage, if you're at all honest about how your marriage is. Even having kids, uh, of course, we love our kids more than ourselves and many of us would willingly sacrifice for them. But as you've been uh, struggling to help them e-learn in these past couple of weeks, you may have discovered just how often you rank your own comfort above the well-being of your children. I think we all have learned this when we've been under house arrest these last couple of weeks. So how do we transform these deep desires? This is a bit harder than we want it to be. This is why Jesus talks about us having to be born again. We need to become wholly new people in order to do this. How do I aim and direct my love? And the answer is by looking to God's love. As John says, 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Or as Augustine says again, probably his most famous quote, you have made us for yourself, Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. If God made and loves us, and if we're made to love him, well, we will find our rest. We will be at peace when our hearts, our loves are ordered rightly with God at the center and in the first place. We love because he first loved us. That means to transform our loves, we have to focus on gospel truth. We have to rehearse gospel truths day in and day out. And you may be thinking, uh, well, why do you keep quoting Augustine and even John? Is this really what Paul is saying? Absolutely. Paul says the exact same thing a little bit earlier in the letter we're reading from now. So here's Galatians 2.20, famous passage in the letter, where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That is the whole idea of new birth, by the way. I need to put myself to death and let Christ live in me. Well, the life I now live in the body, 
if I, I go on living. So yeah, I guess it's still me, even though Christ is the one living. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, and here it is, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see how he goes back to gospel truth? Christ loves me. That's why I can put self to death and live for him as I love others. What this uh, does in us, by the way, is it sets our desires on Christ and in service to him so that what we desire to do is what we ought to do. It's the same idea that John Newton expresses uh, in one of his hymns where he says, uh, our, our pleasure and our duty, though opposite before, since we have seen his beauty, are joined to part no more. So now we do what we should do because we want to do what we should do. That's the hope we have if we lean into this principle. It takes us to our second section then, the precept. So here's Galatians 6 verse 8 now. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So here's the precept, a rule of behavior which emerges from the principle. Are you going to sow to the flesh or sow to the Spirit? Now, that may sound a little confusing to us, but Paul's already explained a bit about what this means in the previous chapter, just a few paragraphs earlier. Here's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. I hope you caught, by the way, as we were reading that passage, how often the word desire shows up. What do we love? Well, the Spirit and the flesh love different things. They lead us in different ways, in different directions, because our weight is our love. It pulls us where it would have us go. He goes on to list the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And we could really summarize both those lists as simply the contrast between selfishness and love. And Paul agrees, by the way, he says in Galatians 5, 14, for the entire law, everything we're supposed to do is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're supposed to do. So the question becomes, am I living to please myself or am I living to love God and my neighbor? The gospel motivates us to sow to the spirit. It empowers our self-denial for the sake of Christ. Uh, Paul explains how this works in a different letter, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. He talks about how Christ's love compels us when we reflect on it. And he goes on to say, He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You see how the gospel frees us from having to live for ourselves because all of our needs and desires are met in Christ and so we can live for him. And to live for Christ is to love for Christ. That's how we fulfill the law of Christ, as Paul says in Galatians 6 two. So we are actively sowing a harvest even now, every day, Every action we perform means we are scattering more seed. And that means that we're also growing in one direction or the other. Or we're, we got more weeds or we got more wheat coming. We cannot remain neutral here. Uh, the, the Christian life, the spiritual life is a little bit like a kid in socks trying to climb up a playground slide. You're either actively running up or you are sliding down. The one thing you can't do is stay right where you are. Or it's a little bit like exercise, honestly. We've got two sets of muscles, you could say, the fleshly and the spiritual. And to work the one is to let the other atrophy. There are eternal consequences to our decisions, to which set of muscles we plan to exercise most. We will either reap eternal life later, of course, in the age to come, but also now as we experience the abundance of life that Christ has for us in the present age, or we will reap destruction later, of course, in the age to come, but also now as we see that our selfishness wreaks havoc in our own lives. I mean, just think of the relationships you have in life, friendships, marriage, colleagues, whatever it may be. 
people who are selfish and selfishly inclined bring destruction on themselves, strip themselves of the joy they could know if they practiced love, the sort of love that comes from following Christ fully. Now, here's the thing. Times of crisis are sowing seasons, if we could call them that. This trial tests us. It's like a spiritual boot camp of sorts. We're going to get lots of exercise or opportunities to exercise in these weeks and months ahead. And so we're doing the 25 milers and full gear and whatnot, and some of us are going to be tempted to give up in that time rather than do the hard work of exercising our spiritual muscles. So we could quit or we could get stronger. When you're working from home right now, and there's some friction that happens with everybody under the same roof all day long. And so you may find that you're blown up at your kids more often than you used to. And every time you do that, you are strengthening a habit. You are strengthening the flesh. Or you could continuously preach the gospel to yourself, die to self, and lean into your kids. Put your comfort to the side and strengthen the spirit. Or you can find yourself wasting the time that you've been granted. You are binge-watching TV shows that are probably not for your edification. You're strengthening the flesh. Or you could redeem the time in prayer, reading, study, meditation, and so strengthen the spirit. That means a time of plague is a time for self-examination. Go out into your field and see what sprouts are coming up. Do you like what you see, or do you want to sow a different seed? The plague searches us. That's the way Cyprian of Carthage put it, uh, writing during a plague in the third century. He says, how suitable, how necessary it is that this plague and pestilence, which seems horrible and deadly, searches out the justice of each and every one and examines the mind of the human race, whether the healthy care for the sick, whether relatives dutifully love kinsmen as they should, whether physicians do not desert the afflicted, and on he goes. The plagues search us. They reveal if we are sowing to the self, to the flesh, for the sake of self-preservation, or if we are sowing to the spirit, acting in self-sacrificial love. It's the old illustration, almost cliched at this point, where you put a glass of water on a chair or something in front of your youth group and you kick the chair and the water spills and you say, so why did water spill? And the kids go, well, because you kicked the chair. Right, okay, we got it. Then you put a glass of iced tea down on the same chair and you kick the chair again and you go, why did iced tea spill? And they say, well, because you kicked the chair. And you go, no, 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 that's why water spilled, remember? You see the point. Why did the glass spill? Well, that's because I kicked the chair. But what came out had to do with what was already inside. When we get the jolt of a crisis, it reveals what is already within us. And in that way, the plague searches us. And that's why this is a time for self-examination. Once we've been searched, and especially if we don't like all that we see, well, it's time to take a step back. When you see rotten fruit, it's time to nourish the root. And so this is why we keep going all the way back, all the way down to the roots, moving from the question, how do I love? What behavior should I be practicing to, well, wait, what do I love? Is, do I love my comfort? Do I love my sense of control more than I love God and therefore love others? And even one step further back to not just what do I love, but hang on, who loves me? We start at the gospel, let the gospel nourish our roots, and then we're going to start to see the fruit change. And that takes us into, well, the fruit, the practice. How do we love? Let's read uh, Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, this is the part you were expecting. This is why you tuned in this morning. You wanted an answer to the question, what should I be doing during plague? But before that, what should you be being? And before that, what should you be loving? Well, assuming we've done that work, we've gotten to this point, we've got the principle, we've got the precept, we can start to think through the practice itself. But let me just encourage you again, don't rush this. 
Like my guess is that some of you are going to look at the practice, and that part's great. I mean, sure, exercise, sow the habit, all of that, that. That's awesome. But don't let this time listening to the sermon be the only time you spend reflecting on what you love. Do the hard work that you need to do. Take the time to examine your heart, to examine your loves, so that your behavior can change for a lifetime and not just for a week or so. Because Paul tells us, don't grow weary in doing good. It's because he knows that, well, doing good can grow wearisome, can't it? This is why we can't white-knuckle our sin into submission or white-knuckle our goodness, focus on the behavior only. It just won't last. A part of what sustains us here in doing good is knowing the future, right? In the midst of so much uncertainty, like, I don't know what my life is going to look like next week. Kyle was sending me some dates for some stuff in the fall, and I said, look, guy, like, I'm planning out for tomorrow, and that's as far as I'm going at this point. So, so much uncertainty right now, and yet we know the end of the story. We know exactly how this goes down. We know what 10 million years looks like. And that's fine. That'll sustain us for the next 10 days or 10 years as well. We will reap a harvest if we persevere. Paul says the same thing. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's the one thing we can be sure of, of all that we do in this lifetime. What we do for the Lord endures. It will last. And so we should not grow weary in doing good, but serve others as we have opportunity, Paul says. Well, in a time of crisis, opportunity abounds, which means our love should abound in a time of crisis as well. To all people, to our neighbors, even to our enemies, Jesus would say, but particularly to the family of God, Paul mentions. Now, why? That might sound a little off-putting to us, like we're kind of cliquish or something like that. Now, part of that is because we are family. And we treat family differently. We do. If my brother loses his job uh, in this time of crisis, the economic disruption that's coming, and somebody that I've never met in Ukraine loses his job because of the economic disruption that's coming, guess which one I'm probably going to help more? Uh, Maybe it's because I'm more aware of the needs, but also because I love my brother in a different way. That's how family is. That's okay. That's what family is supposed to be. But I also think it's because there is more opportunity to love those who belong to the family of God. We have given each other greater permission to love by, for example, rebuking, speaking truth into our lives, carrying each other's burdens, praying for each other in a different way, restoring the fallen and all the rest. But In any case, we're doing good to all people, not just to the family of God. And so, all right, at long last, let's do it. Let's get to the question you've been asking the whole time. What should I be doing during the plague? How do I love my neighbor? As I was working through some of the suggestions I had here, I discovered quickly that they all lined up with the second table in the Ten Commandments. And this is no surprise because Jesus says you can sum up the whole law in the two commands, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's commands one to five. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's commands six to ten. So how do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Well, we look at commands six to ten. So I'm going to use that as my structure here as we go through these practical suggestions. Uh, so the sixth command is don't murder. And you're all feeling pretty good about that. In fact, you've got very little opportunity to murder because you're not allowed to be around people. So you're doing awesome. A a quick reminder, though, that the commandments prohibit the most egregious form of the different sins on view here. And this is why Jesus, when he walks through the commandments in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 in particular, he reminds us of all the implications. He says, what, it's not just don't murder. It, it's don't blow up in anger. Don't call people names. Those are all violations of the Sixth Commandment as well. So this is about much more than just murder. The Westminster Longer Catechism reminds us that this command uh, suggests that we should avoid all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking of life. That's important. What the Catechism is saying and what I think is true is that we just need to be really careful with other people's lives. And that's why in this time, one of the primary ways we love our neighbors is to obey the civil magistrates when they tell us to stay at home and to practice social distancing and all the rest. 
Of course, obeying civil magistrates is a part of obeying the fifth commandment. So you got two commandments for one right here. This is great. But the whole purpose here is to flatten the curve. So hospitals don't reach capacity so that fewer people die because people's lives matter. That's what the sixth commandment is all about. So in this case, obeying our civil magistrates is obedience to God's law here in the sixth commandment as well. I know some of you think this is an overreaction. Some of you think this, this isn't true. I don't think you're right, uh, but you know what? I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, here's the thing. You're not an epidemiologist either. So neither of our opinions counts for anything. So we can just cast that to the side and go ahead and listen to the people who know what they're talking about here. And we would want to be, as, as Christians, leading the way here because of our concern for people's lives. Do not be careless with another person's life. That's the whole point here. Uh, Luther said as much. He wrote during the time of a plague also, and he writes this. You've probably seen this quote go around if you're on social media at all, but it's, it's, it's right on point. He says this, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I shall fumigate, help purify the air, administer medicine and take it. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order not to become con contaminated and thus perchance infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. Let's not be negligent in this duty. The next commandment is don't commit adultery. Uh, again, um, not a ton of opportunity here. Nobody's staying late at the office or anything like that. I, so I can be brief here, but it is important to note that the, the use of pornography has gone up exponentially as people are locked in their homes. And so let's just commit together to be really, really careful in this area. This is a great place for us to love one another and check in on people, especially people who are by themselves, make sure they're doing all right in this area. The Eighth Commandment says, don't steal. And again, that's the most egregious violation of the commandment is the actual theft of property. Paul explains what this looks like uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, where he says, well, look, if you're stealing, you want to make sure you don't steal any longer, but actually work so that you can share with those in need. Do you see how the command not to steal has within it the command to be generous, which, of course, uh, we find that command throughout Scripture as well. This means this is not a time for hoarding or panic buying. That's about self-preservation, which we reject as Christians, and instead embrace a spirit of generous self-sacrifice. And here's the thing. The sacrifice will cost us more now, even as we're generous with our funds. $5,000 is worth more today than it was just a month or so ago because the markets have crashed. That doesn't mean we give less or give less generously. It means we are willing to count a higher cost. Justin Lonis, uh, in an article, Love in an Economic Crisis, which I included in one of our pulses recently, he looks at Acts chapter 4 when Barnabas is selling property and bringing it to the apostles so they can help those in need. He looks at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where it says that the Macedonians, they let their poverty well up in overwhelming generosity. They didn't have the funds, and they still were begging Paul to be a part of his relief effort. He says this about those two passages. He says, what if we saw these texts not as hypothetical scenarios or stories of some halcyon early church days, but as models for actual behavior of churches whenever a crisis hits? That's a mic drop moment right there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is in Scripture because this is what God expects of us. And so will we rise to the occasion as we rehearse gospel truths to be willing to count the cost? Remember, Christ made himself poor, though he was rich, made himself poor for our sakes. We can make ourselves poor for the sake of others as well. Now, the elders have already decided to set aside significant funds from the funds that we have available um, to help families that are going to end up in economic crisis. But if, if, if we go into a depression or something like that, it is not going to last long. We need you to give. We keep giving generously. And of course, it's not just us. There are many other organizations that need that too. We will funnel the funds to those organizations. If you want to give directly to us, you can also give to them too. Ninth commandment is don't bear false witness. Which again gets at the importance of truth. And that's important because we're suffering a plague, a plague of misinformation. We've been in it for a lot longer than we've been in COVID-19, but it is everywhere today. 
and about COVID-19 as well. I read two articles about the same bit of information coming out of the UK. One of them was on a site that is dedicated to news and helped explain what was going on quite carefully. The other one was on a site that is dedicated to winning and therefore doesn't traffic much in news. In fact, the headline to that article was deliberately misleading. There's no other way to put it. We have to be so careful here. As Christians, we should be committed to the truth, and that includes the sources that we take in, certainly includes the sources that we post on social media. For the most part, we probably don't need to do this, especially if the headline is clickbaity. Just move on from it. We all have got an abundance of information as it is. Just, you, you don't need to post it. You don't need to post it. The other way uh, that we keep this command is to spread truth itself. And how do we do that? Well, we make sure that we're soaking in the truth. So let's use this time to soak in scripture instead of soaking in CNN and Fox News or whatever source of news you turn to. Uh, we know scripture is true, so let's lean into that in a different way in this time. And then the 10th commandment, don't covet, which gets at the whole issue of contentment. Contentment is going to be much harder to find in a time of crisis, and yet we have no less reason to feel it. We can rejoice always. We can give thanks in all circumstances because the gospel is unchangingly true, and we have to remember that. But there are going to be times when we're going to look around and go, why did I lose my job or lose these wages, and so-and-so down the street didn't? Why did someone I love die or suffer and so-and-so's neighbor, grandparent, whatever, it didn't happen. One way we overcome this tendency to feel discontent and to covet, to desire another person's life, is to practice gratitude. Gratitude, as I've mentioned before, is, is steeped in grace. And so lean into grace, all that we have. God has given us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. That is reason to be grateful. The opposite of uh, of coveting, where you want what your neighbor has, is the golden rule, of course, to do for your neighbor what you would want done for you. And so I think one way we carry this out is to practice gospel hospitality in ways that are appropriate in an age of social distancing. I put up a number of articles in the Pulse that deal with this, but this certainly looks like shopping for those who are higher risk and should probably stay in. This looks like providing childcare or walking dogs for healthcare professionals who've got to be out and serving in this time, all sorts of other opportunities. I want to mention one other way we practice love in a time of plague, though, and that, of course, is our evangelism as we sow to eternal life in this time. People are asking questions because their world has been rocked. In fact, you may be tuning into this sermon because your world has been rocked and you're asking questions. You don't normally listen to sermons on Sunday morning, but you are desperate for truth at this point. And if that's you, by the way, so glad that you're here with us virtually at least. We look forward to meeting you and being able to chat face to face. And if you got questions, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out. You can get all our information through the website I'd be happy to correspond with you in this time till we can actually sit down and have coffee together. But as people are asking questions, love, listen, and share the reason for the hope that you have. I would hope that you have all reached out to the people on your Oikos list in this last week and that you're going to do so again in the next week. If you're newer to City View and you don't know what that word oikos means, it's not just yogurt. It's the Greek word for your, your sphere of influence. And so it's that group of people that we believe God has placed in our lives so that we can reach them with the truth. Who are the three or four or five names on that list for you? And how can you love them with the truth and with the gospel in this time? Charles Spurgeon, writing during a time of cholera in London, uh, he wrote this. He says, If there ever be a time when the mind is sensitive, it is when death is abroad. I recollect when I first came to London how anxiously people listened to the gospel, for the cholera was raging terribly. There was little scoffing then. We're in a time when there will be little scoffing at the gospel truth because death is abroad and people are asking the most important questions. We have the answers. Jesus alone has the words of life. We can share them with those who need to hear them. As always, as we look to love in a time of plague, Christ sets the pattern for us. He is the proof of the principle, by the way, because he sowed to the Spirit and what he reaped was the church, his people and the eternal life that we experience in him.
And he sets the pattern not only in his death, because I think we look to his death when we talk about uh, a spirit of self-sacrifice plenty. That is true. In Gethsemane, he said, "Not you know, uh, this is not what I want. If it's possible, take this cup from me. But Father, not my will, yours be done. And Hebrews 12 tells us that he endured the cross, scorning its shame because of the joy set before him, which is our salvation. So he sets the pattern in his death, but he sets the pattern in his life as well. Been reflecting on how many times in the Gospels Jesus felt a need. John chapter 4, for example, he comes to the Samaritan woman and he is tired and thirsty and he asks for a drink of water and then discovers, uh, unveils her need, the need for living water. And it's like he puts aside his needs. I don't think he ever gets the drink of water. And yet she gets eternal life and so do many people in her town. That's the example he set for us. Let's follow Christ in a time of plague by loving well in a time of plague. Would you join me in prayer? Father, in our flesh, we are incapable of the sort of love that you are calling us to. But you have loved us so completely and so perfectly that when we let that love fuel us, we can persevere in doing good not growing weary, but loving at every opportunity. So we pray, first of all, that you would help us to order our loves well, that we would love you more than anything else, and that we would be satisfied fully by your love. And as that happens, we would be able to rank ourselves much lower on the list and put the needs of others above our own. Help us to humble ourselves, to do the work of self-examination, to cast aside our idols of personal comfort and control and security and all the rest and lean in to gospel love as we have opportunity. May we be salt and light in this time. May the gospel be written on our lives as we love our neighbors, our enemies, and the family of God well for the sake of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next week.